Hello, I'm Alec Baldwin. Join me on Saturday Night Live with my guest, the Beach Boys. No, uh, we're the, uh, we're the Beastie Boys. Beastie Boys. So you won't be doing Kokomo? 1994 was a big year for the Beastie Boys. Their fourth album, Ill Communication, had dropped on May 31st that year. With this album's release, a massive paradigm shift for rappers MCA, Ad Rock, and Mike D would occur in their career. Their previous album, Check Your Head, saw them return to their punk rock groups with bangers like So What You Want and Gratitude, but Ill Communication was when everything changed for them. Oh yes indeed, it's fun time, it's fun time. Long divorced from the License to Ill era, this time around they were much wiser and possibly even more badass with their rhymes and beats. What they had to offer paid off in spades. It became both their second number one album and second triple platinum album in their career, giving the three MCs a massive foothold in music at the time. MIT's in the house, what you gonna do? Ed Brock's in the house, what you gonna do? MCA's in the house. This was also the year they would be one of the headline acts for Lollapalooza. That's gonna be good and profitable. I feel invigorated. With all the massive success they would incur at that point and for future albums to come, it would be all thanks in part with how many bangers this album would have. But the crown jewel for Ill Communication belongs to their lead single and the subject of today's video. When talking about 90s music videos, one of the most beloved of that decade would be Sabotage. It has everything you could ask for a 90s video. Action, fast paced editing, three friends playing cops. Couple it with one of the most energizing rock songs out there and you have one of the most high octane music videos ever made. Whoa! While the song got moderate success on the radio and the charts, the video would get massive airplay on MTV and be a bestseller on the home market. Most importantly, this video helped launch the career of its director. This video is that awesome. And I'm gonna give you all a history lesson as to how such an amazing video was made. So listen all y'all as it is once again music video time and we are talking about the Beastie Boys Sabotage. <laughs> Now it's a head check with the boys. See this. A good amount of this information comes from, but not limited to, the Beastie Boys book, The Skills to Pay the Bills, The Story of the Beastie Boys by Alan Light, and a commentary track for Sabotage from the Beastie Boys anthology video. Absolutely recommend checking all of these out. The road to the creation of Sabotage's video begins from a photo shoot in 1991. The Beastie Boys were in the middle of making Check Your Head, and during this time, they would be taking part in a photo shoot for the magazine Dirt. Dirt was a short short-lived magazine circulating from 1991 to 1994 and was targeted towards a male demographic. What's important about the shoot was the trio meeting the photographer and co-founder of Dirt, Spike Jones. Spike Jones, the fantastic video director, is here with me speaking about things video. As well as working for Dirt, Jones was also known for his association with blind skateboards and his skateboarding videos, specifically video days. For the time being, this photo shoot was very important for both Jones and the rap group. Spike was a huge fan of the Beastie Boys and he and the rap trio hit it off well. After this shoot, the Beastie Boys would continue to work on Check Your Head and Jones would continue his career as a director. Video Days was a huge success in the skateboarding scene and is fondly remembered as being one of the best skateboarding videos. And with it under Jones' belt, it would begin his career as a music video director. One of the skateboarders, the main subject of the video, Mike Gonzalez, was said to have shared the video with Sonic Youth's Kim Gordon. Gordon was so impressed with Spike's camera work that she wanted him to direct a video for her band. This would result in Jones co-directing Sonic Views 100% with Tamra Davis. Jones primarily directed the skateboarding parts of the video, but this would be his start for music videos. He would end up directing videos for the Breeders' Cannonball, Luscious Jackson's Daughters of the Chaos, and even a Beastie Boys video for their song Time for Living. By the time 1994 rolled around, the Beastie Boys turned to their photographer friend for a new video shoot idea. While at a hamburger hamlet, the four men were discussing the idea for the shoot. And this idea was one that was in the back of one member's mind for years. 
From a quote by Adam Yonk, aka MCA, in a 1999 interview for New York Magazine, for years Beastie Boy Adam Horowitz, Ad Rock, had been talking about doing a photo shoot as undercover cops, wearing ties and fig mustaches and sitting in a car like they were on a stakeout. While the trio approached Jones, he dove into the project literally head first, accompanying his subjects on a prop hunt to a Hollywood wig outlet. Then, while he was taking the pictures, he was wearing this blonde wig and mustache the whole time, for no apparent reason. I had this idea that we should take some pictures of us as undercover cops eating donuts and shit, right? But we thought, we were like, fuck it. We should make a video for that instead. The band loved dressing up as cops so much that this would become the basis for their sabotage video. Along with it, they would have their photographer and friend be the director. Spike Jones himself was really excited about being given the opportunity. As he said in the Beastie Boys book, which he wrote a chapter dedicated to the making of the sabotage video, he wrote up the treatment to the music video, and the treatment was simple. They make the opening credits to a 70s cop show and do whatever throughout. With this treatment, Jones took it to the production company he was working for, Propaganda Films, where they offered the budget at 85000 Now, 85000 does not seem like a lot of money to make for a music video, and Adam Yock did not like the set budget at all. In fact, he thought the budget should be made much cheaper. Yak explained this to New York Magazine. We've done videos where the production people came up with these elaborate budgets and it started to feel really awkward on the set. The Beastie Boys wanted something different this time around. Running around like maniacs with no proper permits or cops or fire department or anything. They had a meeting with the people who ran propaganda and told them they didn't need things like police extras or close down sets or even makeup trailers. And while the production company explained to them this is how music videos work and this is how they make videos, the boys threatened to go to a different production studio to shoot sabotage. This threat worked. The budget was slash 35 grand, so now with a $50,000 budget, it was time to shoot a music video. They did a lot to make this music video be as cheaply made as possible. Along with being the director, Spike Jones was also the director of photography for the music video. The wigs and mustaches were bought wholesale at a place called Garland Wigs and Beauty Design. They also hit up a Kmart and a thrift shop to purchase other materials like clothing. The car they used for the video was essentially a clunker, with Mike D telling Vanity Fair that it was on the verge of death throughout their two-day shoot. We, we we almost killed the car a couple of times, but we definitely didn't come close to killing ourselves. MCA would also be the stunt driver for the car, so every action you see was done by Yacht. The production crew, meanwhile, was just Spike Jones and anyone else that could fit inside a van they also used. Another major cost-cutting strategy they used involved their shooting permits. And I mean they didn't have any. Hey! Cops! We don't have a permit. Run! They basically ran around Los Angeles pretending to be cops with fake wigs and mustaches and made up every scenario you see in the video on the spot. And they did their best to make it seem like they were all over the place, when in actuality, some spots they'd done were in familiar places. One rooftop, for example, was actually the propaganda film's roof. And in this shot, when Sir Stuart Wallace gets tackled into the hotel's pool, that's not the actual hotel pool. It was Mike D's personal pool, which means they shot at Mike D's house. Nice place you got here. Speaking of, while Jones was the director, it would be Mike Diamond himself to be the one barking orders for the videos. And Jones, meanwhile, did a weird thing where while they were shooting, he himself would be in disguise in wigs while shooting. I guess he was just committed to the bit. As for the three rappers, they had to wear a lot of hats during the shoot. And when I say hats, I mean wigs as they had to play at least three characters throughout. Spike Jones and another crew member also assisted in playing body doubles. The only other person to properly appear in the video would be the disc jockey, DJ Hurricane, who appears as Fred Kelly as Bunny. <laughs> A funny detail to also mention was that they were all supposed to have facial hair in the music video, but MCA forgot this task and Mike D couldn't grow any facial hair, which resulted in Ad Rock being the only one to sport anything real. But as cheaply made as they could for this music video, there were two incidents that made the music video go over budget. When Sir Stuart Wallace gets tackled into the pool, there's a shot that's underwater. This ended up damaging the Canon Scopic they were using as Jones was only using a Ziploc bag to make it waterproof. And judging by how big these are, I don't think the Ziploc was big enough. Luckily they convinced the rental company that it just stopped on its own and they weren't the wiser. But that wasn't the only camera they broke. They also had an Auriflex SR3 fall out of a van window while filming, and this resulted in an $84,000 write-off. Altogether, the budget was said to have tripled in budget. Oh my God! 
And apparently they also shot a third day with them performing Sabotage as a group, but that it was never used and I'm not sure what they did with the footage. Once production wrapped, they had 6 hours of footage to turn into a 3 minute music video. After going through the editing process, it was completed in April 1994 and would make its debut on MTV for the week of May 15th, 1994. Though even then, MTV standards and practices demanded a re-edit. This included taking out a shot of weapons such as the knife and the axe used to smash open a door, and the scene with the dummy falling to the ground would also have to be cut. But despite these censors, the music video was an absolute smash on MTV as it's played on the channel for a long time. One issue of Billboard had it listed on the channel for the week of September 4th, 1994, and another said it played into the following year with a listing in the March 26th, 1995 issue. This video had legs and it knew how to run with them. Sticking to its treatment, the concept of this video of it being a cop show opening, Sabotage gets it down to a T. There are a lot of cop shows in the 70s Sabotage has been compared to, and the BC Boys did watch plenty of VHS tapes of cop shows to get their inspiration, with Mike D even name dropping one for his Vanity Fair interview. We, we all watched videotapes of, uh, VHS videotapes of uh, Streets of San Francisco and other shows, and we were like, that would be awesome if we could actually pull off our own version. And I say they got the aesthetic down perfectly. Their low budget has the video look cheaply made, which helps drive home what they're parodying. And it's a loving parody at that. And this should go without saying, but Sabotage is just an awesome song to listen to. It being juxtaposed as being the theme song to a cop show that just gives off the impression that they spent more money on the song than anything else. And this adds to the wacky sense of humor Spike Jones and the BC Boys have for this song. <laughs> Everything looks so cheesy, but they act with no sense of awareness of how ridiculous this all is. And they make damn good use of these characters. Who can forget such memorable characters as Nathan Wind as Kochek, Alessandro Algas as the Chief, and of course, the Rookie, played by Vic Kofari. It's pure cheese and it's fun. In terms of how the song did commercially, at the time, it peaked at number 19 on the Rock and Alternative chart, but it didn't crack the Hot 100. Instead, it peaked at number 15 on the Bubbling Under 100 chart. Doesn't seem like it did that well, judging by Billboard's charts. The VHS sales, however, are a different story. September 20th, 1994 saw the release of the Sabotage video album for VHS, and while I couldn't find how many copies it sold exactly, it did peak at number 3 on Billboard's video charts, as well as staying on that chart for multiple weeks. It even dropped off the charts before making re-entry. As well, it was certified gold by the British Phonographic Industry, and to even get gold on the BPI, you'd have to sell at least 100,000 copies. <laughs> Hi, I'm Brittany. And I'm Susan. Welcome, Welcome to, to Chow LA. LA. The same year as Ill Communication, County Central had a short-lived TV show called High Octane. This was created by Sofia Coppola and Zoe Cazavetes in various interviews and skits. The show didn't last long, with four episodes being made, but Comedy Central only airing three of them. Their second episode features their interview segment Chow LA, and during this, they interview the cast of Sabotage. And I don't mean they interview the Beastie Boys during this. We're sitting here with Nathan Wind, Alessandro Allegra, and Vic Kafari from the hit series Sabotage. Actors who were real-life undercover cops and actors who bring their stories of real-life crime to TV. I mean they interview the actors the Beastie Boys play in Sabotage, acting like Sabotage the TV show exists. Tell me guys, who are the real men of Sabotage? It adds an interesting piece of depth toward these characters you see in our three minute music video. If you're into that. I love sports. I love athletes. I love being a man, but sometimes I love men too. Which I am. It makes sense for them to make this type of joke since the humor fits in line with the Beastie Boys, but I also think the main reason this came to fruition was because Sofia Coppola and Spike Jones were dating at the time. So that probably helped make this happen. In terms of reception to this music video, oh, you bet this was well received. Yes! Yeah, yeah, here it is! It's about the time. It's on, buddy, it's on! For awards, it won two of the Music Video Production Awards, with Spike winning Best Director and Eric Zubrinin for Best Editor. Not sure how he won since Haynes Hall is credited for editing the video, but I digress. For the 1994 Video Music Awards, this video would be nominated for five Moon Men, including Video of the Year. And with the massive acclaim this video has, you would think it won during the event. Aerosmith. Not at all. 
This is possibly one of the most infamous shutouts for the VMAs. They would lose all five of their nominations to two other music videos that night. Video of the Year, Best Group Video and Viewer's Choice went to Aerosmith's Crying, while Breakthrough Video and Best Direction in a Video would be given to R.E.M.'s Everybody Hurts. R.E.M. Thanks God, Everybody Hurts! It seems very imperative that these losses were not warmly welcomed by the BC Boys camp, especially during the acceptance of Best Director. Everybody Hurts! This is an outrage because Spike is the director that has just... I'm from Switzerland, okay? Let me just tell everyone that. You might be wondering who on earth this later hosing wearing individual that just pulled a Kanye West on Michael Stipe is. Let's talk about Nathaniel Hornblower. Hornblower is a Swiss music video director for the Beastie Boys. By this time, he directed numerous music videos for the three MCs, Shadrach from 1989 and 1992, So What You Want. He was also apparently MCA's uncle. By Spike's special friend, Swiss filmmaker Nathaniel Hornblower, who we now know is really beastie Adam Yauch in Lederhosen. Yeah, definitely the uncle of MCA and nothing else. This would end up becoming the first time ever someone would rush the stage on the VMAs, and certainly not the last. This is a farce that I had all the ideas for Star Wars and everything. Not to mention that R.E.M.'s Michael Stipe wouldn't be in on the joke. Wow. <laughs> I saw it coming, you know, I was like... My heart was beating, I you know, wanted to stop it from happening because you know, it's just an appalling situation. I just want to tell everyone that this is a farce. In 2020, Yahoo would interview the two surviving members of the Beastie Boys during their release of their documentary, Beastie Boys Story. I remember a friend of Michael Stipe's told me pretty soon after, basically when he found out what was going on, which was after the fact, I think he was honestly pretty surprised of, at being bum-rushed by Hornblower at that moment. He thought it was pretty funny. Although I did hear what other people from R.E.M.'s record label, Warner Brothers, were not psyched about Hornblower. Don't you want to know what our reaction to Yacht's f***ing uncle doing that? I think that's a story that no one's talking about. Horwitz interjects with a chuckle. We were all backstage and you could see it on the little monitor. We were about to go on, so we were right there, says Diamond. I was like, Yacht, what's your f***ing uncle doing? And he was like, I don't know, it just happened. And that's the first and last time his uncle ever came to one of those f***ing award shows with us. But it doesn't appear there would be any repercussions for the Beastie Boys from this. On the plus side, Michael Stife didn't seem bothered by the moment either. It was a little bit of revolution in the MTV Video Awards. I'm assuming that they were expecting Spike Jones would win Best Director that year and everyone, including Horblower, would go on stage to accept it. Not to say Jake Scott didn't deserve the win, but I think a lot of people were expecting Sabotage to win something that that night. And I would like to think MTV knew that the music video being shut out was a mistake. As in 2009, they made a category called Best Video That Should Have Won a Moon Man. Sabotage was nominated and ended up, paradoxically, winning a Moon Man for not winning a Moon Man. Over the years, this music video would acquire a lot of tributes and be influential to future works. I'm gonna set it straight this Watergate! Choose life. Choose a job. Choose a career. The opening to Danny Boyle's train spotting, for example, was said to be influenced by the music video. As well, this music video has been recreated multiple times with various different outcomes, one of which being made with Sesame Street characters. It was also recreated as a digital comic by Derek Langley as a tribute to Adam Yonk after his passing in 2012. 2023, meanwhile, saw action figures being made by the Beastie Boys as characters from the video. But possibly the most interesting remark I've seen about the video would come from comedian Amy Poehler. A huge fan of the group, she has a chapter in the Beastie Boys story where she reviews her favorite music videos by the trio. Here's what she said about Sabotage. I truly believe there would be no Anchorman, no Wes Anderson, no Lonely Islands videos, and no channel called Adult Swim this video did not exist. It hit a lot of sweet spots for me. Bad wigs, obvious dummies thrown off buildings, shots of Yonk with tape on his mouth, and then rack focus to a ticking bundle of dynamite. This song was kind of like Madonna's Vogue in that it had built-in moments for people to freeze frame and strike a pose. To capitalize on this in a video was genius, and I enjoyed it as much as my two young sons did when I played it for them for the first time. Polo does raise an interesting thought. You can argue that this helped inspire a lot of things like Anchorman or the Adult Swim block. Before music video that parodies cop shows, why hasn't there ever been a proper adaptation to Sabotage? Yeah, I can't find this new show. Maybe you can help me out. Have you seen it? It's been all over MTV. It's 
called Seven. If there were to be one, it wouldn't be the first time that a music video would be adapted for television. See the failed pilot to Dog Police as an example. <laughs> Also watch my video to Dog Police. Anyways, there was a chance Spike Jones and the Beastie Boys would make a movie together. However, this wouldn't have been a sabotage movie. In 2013, IndieWire interviewed Jones about the unproduced movie he and the boys wrote together. It was to be called We Can Do It. It was centered around Nathaniel Hornblower and sabotage's Sir Stuart Wallace. Mike D was supposed to be a country singer and Ad-Rock was supposed to be Nino Vincenzi and be like John Travolta's character in Saturday Night Fever, except be unable to dance. Seems like this idea may have come to fruition from the Hey Ladies music video. But Jones made it clear that there wasn't going to be any 70s cops in the movie, but it was going to be in the same spirit as Sabotage. So while we will never get a real adaptation to this video by the future director of Adaptation, its legacy does live on by spawning a slew of comedies that you could very much say was heavily inspired by what the Beastie Boys made in 1994. <laughs> And speaking of the music video, it has garnered a lot of critical acclaim since its initial premiere. It has shown up on numerous best of lists and is widely regarded as one of the greatest music videos of all time. And it's hard to debate the claim. This video is one of the prime cuts of 90s music videos. With its success, it helped not only give Beastie Boys a boost in their careers, but launched Spike Jones to become a pioneer in music videos. And there are plenty of music videos by Jones that could easily be covered on music video time. <laughs> And we will certainly get to them in the future. For now, I would absolutely recommend tracking down a copy of the Sabotage VHS. It has more than just a music video in it, but it also includes some outtakes that are worth checking out. Or you can give the Beastie Boys video anthology a check out. It was made by Criterion Collection back in 2000, which included this and 17 other music videos by the group. This anthology has the treatment to the video, video commentary, and even the high octane segment. But just watching the video by itself through YouTube or through an old MTV rip, you end up watching a music video that in just three minutes sparks one of the most pivotal moments in music video history. It may be called sabotage, but this music video is anything but a cop out. Sabotage! Thanks for your time. Oh my, it's a mirage telling you all it's a sabotage. Sabotage, yeah. Peace, we out!